Thanks, everyone. Welcome. It's a hot topic. Not my name, but GraphRag. So let's talk about the fast track to production with Amazon Bedrock and Neo4j or a DB. I'll start with something we all know. The world's changing. Information is becoming more connected and more complex. Organizations have a tremendous amount of data now. And the question is increasingly, how do we get more interesting and important insights from this data? How do we turn it into knowledge that we can act upon? Generative AI is racing towards over a trillion dollars in revenue. The counterpoint that underlies the opportunity and the challenge here is most organizations are stuck in a pilot or proof of concept phase. There's incredible pent up value, but only a minority of organizations are positioned to truly capitalize upon it. So yes, we're going to talk about graphs. They're not just solving today's difficult problems. They're also providing the foundation for tomorrow's solutions. This surge in generative AI is only a few years old, but it's already revolutionizing how we interact with information. I'm sure everyone here has played with the chatbots, image generators. They can do amazing things. But they can also cause you to laugh or even get frustrated when they miss the mark. We've gone from this everlasting AI winter to a slight thaw of machine learning, and now we've all of a sudden been thrust into the Gen AI spring. But generative AI alone isn't a business information system. It's amazing, it can, but it can't do things even simple web applications can do. I can't ask it, tell me how many people have already picked up their badge here today at reInvent. Because it's trained on old data, and it gives amazing but probabilistic answers based on what it was already trained on. This is where RAG came in, Retrieval Augmented Generation. Take a question, then using some form of retriever, query a data source to return relevant information. Return that relevant information to the LLM as additional context, and then get a more relevant answer. It's great. It raised the ceiling on what's possible. But we've also found in too many cases, the results are still too unreliable for production workloads. Generative AI needs knowledge graphs. I like to think about it as separations of concerns brought together under a simple, straightforward systems architecture. Part of your architecture handles the language side, the creativity, where it's not possible to program all the different paths you need to go down. The other part manages the knowledge, facts, and surrounding context to give you accurate answers. Enter GraphRag. Now here's a straightforward information flow implemented in numerous easy to use frameworks like Llama Index, Valium, Langchain, etc. So you have your application, a question comes in. From that question, you generate your vector embeddings. You take those embeddings and you query your knowledge graph. From there, you can expand out in the knowledge graph following the relationships of the nodes that it returns and pull in more richer, relevant context. Return that context to the LLM and then provide an answer. It's pretty straightforward. So RAG put a database on the path to the LLM. GraphRag takes it to the next step, building upon these early steps. When you put a knowledge graph on the retrieval path, things get much better. Let's quickly talk about three concrete benefits of GraphRag, starting with higher accuracy. And don't just take my word for it. There's an increasing amount of research being published that shows dramatic improvements when you use a GraphRag-based approach compared to a baseline vector-based approach. The second one is easier development. And I think this example of apples and oranges are both fruit makes it clear. 
Here is the graph example, which I think intuitively anyone understands. If you were to stand in front of a whiteboard and draw it, I bet this is naturally what comes. This is the vector space equivalent. Probably. I can't validate this up here on stage. I made a joke with my design team that if they switched apple and fruit, there's no way I would be able to tell. I still don't know if they actually did that or not. It's opaque to a human who's developing against this and trying to debug your application. A lot of context goes missing when you're using vectors. I was using a photo app just before, and I asked it to search for paintball photos. And the first two results it returned was my wife standing in the backyard in winter holding our little kid. Apparently, it thinks that is pretty close to my paintball matches a few years ago. I think any of us looking at it would know that's probably not paintball. But that context goes missing in vector space. In a knowledge graph, you have an explicit topology where neighbors are counted in hops, one hop, two hop away. In a vector world, you have geometry. We're told, and I think this is strictly incorrect, that near means similar. It doesn't. Near means near. There's a lot of context that's missing. And that's why you see a lot of people doing a solely vector-based approach end up with results that come back that just don't make sense. And they're very hard to explain. Don't get me wrong. Both have their uses. And I think, ideally, they're both used together. Finally, and just as important, because we're talking about production workloads here, is explainability and governance. Knowledge graphs are transparent. You can reason about them. You can also govern them. Neo4j has best-in-class security primitives that you can build upon, read, write, traversal permissions that you can assign to a user role, which means you can query against the graph and transverse through privileged parts of the graph that you cannot read or write. What this means is your queries will return correct results, meaning the context you're providing to the LLM is correct, without being able to see privileged information that is used to connect some of those dots. So you can serve vertical roles within your organization, while the knowledge graph itself serves that horizontal role. So that's the big three there, higher accuracy, easier development, explainability and governance. I want to come back to easier development a little bit, because I think we forget about it's not just developers at the end of the day once something's in production. You might have an on-call team. You might have a support team that's trying to understand what's happening. We have a new tool that we're releasing, our Copilot, that enables you to put in simple language and pull back the equivalent Cypher query against the schema of your database. So you can automatically generate Cypher and then use things like our Bloom visualization tool. This really makes it easy to explore the space, to also pull back the information your LLM might be using to see where the error is, and then make adjustments to your knowledge graph. So this is where I was going to switch to a demo and get hands on and start deploying it. The demo gods are not smiling upon me, and I broke it. Rather than debugging it live in front of you, which I'm sure would be an experience, I'll just talk through some of the architecture. We can look at the GitHub repository of the example code later. We can also um, show you the code and walk through some of the key examples at the Neo4j booth, if anyone wants to do that after. But for today, I'm just going to walk through five key areas to consider when you're building your GraphRag application. The first one, and I think this is really understated for people who are starting out, it's understanding the data sources. Where is the existing information that you're pulling from to build your knowledge graph that this is going to be built upon? It could be structured sources such as existing databases or programmatic sources like JSON and XML documents, CSE files. It could be existing ontologies you have within your organization. It could even be unstructured data like PDFs, scans, images, videos. You want to build a pipeline around this to build your initial knowledge graph. You might already have one. And this step is still relevant because you're going to be continually updating your knowledge graph, pulling in new information, refining it, 
and expanding it. The second key area is that extraction and ingestion phase. And here's where Amazon Bedrock first enters. At its most basic, it allows you to run LLM models, say Anthropics Claude. And with a bit of prompt engineering, you can convert even your unstructured PDF documents into nodes, relationships, and properties that you insert into your knowledge graph. There's a lot of steps here, including generating your vector embeddings. There's a lot of nuance to the steps of this particular phase when you get into the code, from chunking the information to various optimizations on the prompt, fine tuning of the model itself as well. You also need to think about things like data deduplication. If you think about company names that you're pulling in from unstructured document, in practice I found typos are, are plentiful through there. You have companies that change their branding or merge with other companies. And so you need some sort of process to think about resolution of these different nodes within your knowledge graph. The third key area is where does this information go once you've transformed it? And so Neo4j, AuraDB is a fully managed database that supports both the graph side as well as vector search. So you can do both the embeddings and querying that into the knowledge graph, as well as traversal of the knowledge graph itself. It has a bunch of tools built around it as well to help you manage that knowledge graph. From the co-pilot that I mentioned before, Bloom, which is a visualization tool that allows you to bring up a graphical representation of the relationships and explore them live as well as the graph data science algorithms that allow you to do things like page ranks. So you can pull back the most relevant nodes when you might return a 1,000 nodes in a particular query, or community detection. So you can label groups of things that are highly related and correlated with each other within your knowledge graph. So the first half is actually half of the problem. This is building your knowledge graph, maintaining your knowledge graph. Where do you store it? Now you want to serve it out to your application. Again, Amazon Bedrock comes in here. You can start off with foundational models. You can fine tune it on your own private data and run the fine tune models as you're improving the accuracy of the system. You have some sort of API that you're using to serve that graph rag pattern we talked about before. A question comes in, create vector embeddings, query against the knowledge graph, expand the context to relevant information, maybe do some pruning as well, so it's only the most relevant context, and then you get richer questions out. To me, the really interesting part comes in that last key area, fifth one, and this is the actual applications you're building. This is where the value to your business is. We want to help you with the tooling on the first floor to make that as seamless as possible. We have a knowledge graph builder that helps with unstructured data ingestion. We're working on text to Cypher so you can convert prompts into Cypher queries and have fine tuning data to help you optimize against that as well. But whether it's enterprise search or the ever popular FAQ bot or discovery, I want to find out what plays are on tonight in Las Vegas while I'm visiting. You're going to get much richer and more relevant results using that graph rag pattern where you can prune out irrelevant things that the vectors are inevitably going to return. So here I would go to the console, but I won't today. We can do the console at the Neo4j booth. But I do want to mention, just towards that last key area, this year Neo4j did get four new competencies to help in specific areas, whether it's financial services, the automotive industry, generative AI and machine learning, and of course we have the same one from last year with data and analytics competency. We're one of the few vendors that has five competencies. We have a lot of people, some of them are here today, that are really engaged in building out your specific use case and helping you understand the nuances when you're building out these patterns, because the simple architecture, that initial proof of concept or pilot, isn't that hard to get started. The real trick is what are the details and how do you get down to something that's ready for a production workload. So with that, I want to thank you for coming. I'm happy to take any questions or I can step to the side and we can also talk. And don't forget the Neo4j booth, there's a lot of people there. We're getting lots of questions about how do you migrate from a vector only 
to the Graphrag style system to solve some of these issues people are having in production today.